the signs do suggest that there are some profound changes going on behind the scenes that are working in favor of gold. Will I live to see the day? I, I don't know. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, July 26th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, July 26, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Once again, if you are new to this channel or you have not already done so, please do subscribe, hit the bell to be notified on new updates, and give us a thumbs up. If you like what we do, we truly do appreciate your support. Chris Powell is our guest today. Chris is the secretary and treasurer of the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, also known as GATA, which he co-founded in 1999 to expose the rigging of the gold market by Western central banks and their investment bank agents. We're delighted to have Chris back as a return guest today. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Chris Powell. Chris, welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? Oh, very good. And it's great to be with you again, Pat. It's great to have you again. We haven't seen you in a while. I think the last time we saw you was when you were in Singapore and we got to speak to you in the vault. Yes, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> it was actually. Chris, how have you been so far with the pandemic just wreaking havoc on our social lives and the economy? Is it pretty surreal to see people wearing masks and moving restrictions imposed and lockdowns all throughout the world? Yeah, it is uh, bizarre. and. Uh... I feel very lucky, uh, you know, I'm still able to uh, pay the mortgage and, uh, and buy food, but there are millions of people uh, who have lost their jobs and uh, can't uh, feed themselves and their families, can't pay their rent uh, in fear of eviction. Um, this is a really horrible situation. For yourself and Bill, how are the speaking engagements, how have they been affected? Were conferences canceled or did you find yourself having to do more and more presentations online? Yeah, that's pretty much uh, it. I mean, there's <laughs> there, there, there's some conferences that don't want us around anymore because uh, the uh, the story of gold price suppression, while it uh, I think it explains the great potential for uh, mining gold, mining company shares and and gold and silver prices. Uh, it also tells uh, uh, investors what they're up against. Uh, certain governments don't want uh, free markets. They don't want uh, the monetary metals challenging their currencies, and that can impair the the, uh, the promotion of uh, of gold mining shares. Um, so uh, some conferences uh, that are mainly interested in touting mining shares uh, don't want us around uh, anymore. Um, uh, other conferences uh, still uh, welcome us, but uh, they're not uh, able to be held, uh, you know, given the epidemic uh, circumstances. Uh, uh, the only one that uh, I'm invited to uh, that you know has seems to even be scheduled tentatively right now is the Mining Investment Asia Conference uh, in Singapore, which has been uh, postponed to, till early November. If it will even be held uh, then, nobody really uh, really knows. Uh, I uh, hope to make it if it is uh, being held uh, after all, and if uh, you know travel is uh, permissive enough, uh, but. You're right. Uh, most things now seem to be done uh, on the Internet. Have you noticed any improvements in the receptivity of people towards the topic of manipulation of the gold price? I mean, after all that has happened with the, the pandemic this year? Yeah, I, I find uh, more people accepting of it, if, if, if only resentfully, because they realize governments are rigging you know, every other market. So it's harder to argue that they... They wouldn't be intervening uh, in the monetary metals markets. Uh, I've found for really a couple of years now that uh, uh, fewer and fewer people wanted to argue the point. Uh, there is you know, so much documentation now. Um, it, it's, it's been years since anybody even tried to argue the documentation, but I, I find that nobody wants to really counter our uh, assertions uh, at all now because there is too much documentation. And... Uh, because it's so obvious that governments are uh, comprehensively rigging markets now. Yeah. Um, 
you know, Chris, this huge gold and silver price crash in, in March, it resulted in a big deviation between the spot price and the physical price of precious metals. And I believe this was the most acute and drawn out bifurcation of paper and physical prices in years. Do you think this episode of price bifurcation is a sign that is increasingly difficult for the paper market to dominate prices for physical gold and silver? Yes, very much so. Um, there's uh, too much physical demand now for the paper system to accommodate. The paper system needs to produce a certain amount of metal uh, just to sustain itself. And uh, uh, there's very little metal available, if any, at the so-called spot price. Uh, uh, you know, you can get as, as much imaginary metal as you want uh, at the spot price, but getting real metal for delivery is is very difficult. The uh, the London market broke down and 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 turned to the COMEX in in New York, which has uh, always been uh, almost entirely a derivative market. And now uh, suddenly uh, the uh, the COMEX is a major delivery market. There's huge physical offtake for both gold and silver uh, on the New York Commodities Exchange, which has never happened before. Uh, you know that's an enormous change that uh, indicates there's some uh, some big things going on behind the uh, the curtain. Uh, you know, for the over the last year, there was uh, really last two years, there was uh, huge increases in the use of the uh, exchanges, uh, so-called exchange for physical uh, mechanism, which was a, a a way of getting contracts off the the exchange, settling them off the exchange, uh, transferring the obligation for delivery to uh, to London, and then rolling over the obligations in London so they, the, the metal was never actually getting delivered. It appears that the uh, uh, London authorities are no longer permitting the constant rolling over of the exchange for physical obligations in London, and so the demand is for, for real metal is bounced back to New York. Uh, I mean, these, these are very, very big changes that uh, I think suggest to us very strongly that uh, metal is scarce. Okay, so um, keeping in line with that, have you heard of any delivery difficulties on comics between March and now? No, I haven't. Uh, I have, you know, heard for you know at least a year from uh, traders in, in in Europe that it is very difficult to get delivery of of metal. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there have been no complaints about defaults coming out of uh, uh, out of the uh, New York Commodities uh, Exchange. Um, I suspect that at some point we will have another London gold pool type failure. Uh, the metal will just uh, run out or uh, perhaps more likely the central banks will step in and revalue gold officially to a much higher level and, and, and somehow underwrite the losses of the, the, the shorts. But uh, uh, metal is still, is still being delivered, but uh, in enormous amounts in places where it had not been delivered before. So it certainly bears watching that. Do you think this, let's call it a supply squeeze on physical metals and the shock on paper markets led to the steady rise of the gold price to today? Well, I, I think uh, the the demand has uh, increased substantially because money creation has increased uh, by incredible amounts. And uh, the gold price, the silver price, the prices of monetary metals uh, are ratios uh, between uh, uh, currencies and and the the metal supply, uh, so you know it stands to reason if uh, if all of a sudden uh, the money supply is infinite, people you know would want to hedge themselves a little bit with uh, with metal, and I think that they are demanding increasingly real metal rather than paper indicates a growing recognition uh, of the long-standing gold price silver price suppression scheme with paper with with futures contracts. I, I think. People are beginning to figure it out that uh, if you can't hold it in your hands or you can't see it in, the, in, in, in your vault, uh, you don't own it. You know, Jerome Powell, he's or the government, they're bailing out all kinds of industries and businesses. And but I don't think they gave too much of a bailout to the gold and silver industry. But yet the price gets knocked down and it ends up having higher lows and it bounces back pretty, pretty quickly. Is that Part of the reason why all this money printing that you think right now gold and silver they seem to bounce back pretty quick yeah well that's uh, that's another very big change over the last uh, year or so uh, pat the the smashes that we believe have been engineered 
by governments and central banks and in the, in the gold and silver market are, are not having their traditional effect. Uh, usually they were they were able to keep uh, the price down after a smash for weeks, even months. Now they can't keep it down for 48 hours. And that's a signal. You know, both Bill Murphy and, and your work at GATA has seen you guys raising awareness of rigging in the precious metals markets and also challenging regulators to deal with this issue of market manipulation effectively. What's the latest updates regarding how GATA is engaging regulators regarding the issue of price manipulation in the gold market? I think there's a couple of big developments there, Pat. Uh, uh, first, perhaps, uh, our consultant, Robert Lamborn, uh, who uh, studies the Bank for International Settlements and its monthly and annual reports, uh, has found that the intervention in the gold market by the BIS is at its highest level in three years. Uh, the BIS is actively trading uh, gold derivatives and, and gold swaps, and it's uh, a uh, monthly report shows that it is doing more so uh, uh, of that uh, than it has done uh, in three years. Uh, something's going on there. The BIS uh, intervenes in the gold market only at the behest of its uh, members' central banks. Now, uh, doesn't mean the BIS is intervening in gold uh, for all central banks at the same time. It could be, but it, at least it's it's intervening in, in the gold market, uh, you know, for at least one central bank, presumably the, the United States. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, secondly, uh, of great importance, I think, the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission is uh, steadfastly refusing to answer the questions put to it by U.S. Representative Alex Mooney of, of, of West Virginia, questions that the CFTC, uh, you know, would not answer for GATA a couple of years ago. And those questions are, first, uh, is the uh, CFTC aware of uh, trading by governments in the, uh, uh, in the futures markets? Uh, and secondly, uh, is the CFTC, does the CFTC have jurisdiction over manipulative trading by governments and central banks uh, that is undertaken with the approval of the U.S. government? Now, uh, the CFTC at least ought to be able to answer the first question, that is, whether it's aware of trading by governments and central banks in, in the futures markets in the United States, because there have been filings, official filings by the CME group, the operator of the New York Commodities Exchange, about its so-called central bank incentive program, in which the COMEX gives uh, uh, volume trading discounts to governments and central banks that surreptitiously trade futures in the United States, and not just gold and silver futures, but all futures contracts uh, offered by uh, the New York Commodities Exchange. So there's there's official filings by CME Group with both the CFTC and the Securities and Exchange Commission about the central bank incentive prog program. So why can't the CFTC admit that it has these filings, but it, it, it refuses to do that? Uh, yeah, perhaps more interestingly, it it will not give its opinion as to its own authority as to whether the commission has jurisdiction to regulate manipulative trading by governments. Now, I think that ought to give the way the game away to any any reasonable person. If uh, if a government agency can't answer uh, a simple question like that, a question of law, can't even acknowledge it. I think that you know tells you that something is going on here. That the agency and the you know the greater government uh, doesn't want the public to know about because it would disturb the world. You know, Chris. Adding to this, uh, Bloomberg reported back in February of this year that the Justice Department and the CFTC are still building a case against the bank for rigging precious metal futures through spoofing, which is a practice where orders are placed and then canceled to sort of trick other market participants. What's your view regarding this spoofing case against J.P. Morgan, and do you think it will amount to any significant change in the precious metals industry? You know, it very much puzzles me, Pat, because uh, I don't think uh, J.P. Morgan Chase would be doing anything in the monetary metals markets, the currency markets, uh, without the assent of the U.S. government. Now, uh, if Morgan has been executing uh, government trades, I think it's very plausible that uh, Morgan traders could be front-running government trades, um, but uh, the spoofing is is really the small small part of it. Um, the government intervention would be much 
much bigger than, than spoofing. Now, with the, with the Justice Department already have uh, gotten convictions uh, and confessions from Morgan traders and uh, those confessions implicating the highest officials at the uh, at the bank. Um, I, I'm just puzzled that that, uh, you know, surely uh, uh, J.P. Morgan has as much on the government as the government has on J.P. Morgan. Uh, if, if, you know, Morgan has been executing government policy, uh, executing government trades. Uh, so, you know, why is uh, the government prosecuting these lower level Morgan traders? Um, you know, I'm, I'm one possible explanation is it's, it's uh, that it's just cover that they're, they're setting up lower level fall guys. I, I don't know, but the, uh, the prosecution very much puzzles me, uh, because uh, Morgan is certainly, it's a primary dealer in U.S. government securities that has executed many policies for, for the Federal Reserve and the Treasury over the years. If, uh, if, the, if the government pressed Morgan too hard criminally, uh, I, I think uh, the Morgan people could tell some interesting stories about the government, too. Yeah, wouldn't that be uh, something to, to behold? But J.P. Morgan, is it true that although J.P. Morgan has a seemingly perpetual short position for precious metals derivatives, but it's still net long given its even larger stash of physical precious metals. Well, that's uh, mostly speculation to me, Pat. I, I don't know what Morgan's true position, true net position in, in any market is. It could have a position on the COMEX uh, that's reported that is uh, balanced offset by a position in uh, over-the-counter markets in London that are not reported, um, I, I don't think we can count on uh, you know any any assertion as to what Morgan is really doing, uh, what its position is in any market at any particular time on a net basis. You might you might get a report for one particular market where public reports are required, uh, but you know would you? know what the bank's full position throughout the world is uh, on, on balance. Uh, uh, I don't think you could find that out without really the going through the bank's own books, which hasn't happened yet. Okay. Yeah, because it seems like um, precious metals trading is pretty profitable for J.P. Morgan. And in a recent Ted Butler article, the bank made billions in gold and silver trading on the comics for the past 12 years. Uh, the question is, why is it that J.P. Morgan is doing so well in precious metals trading while other banks like Scotiabank is paying hundreds of millions in losses to wind down their gold trading unit? Well, again, this is just speculation. But, you know, if you're executing trades for the U.S. government uh, and if the U.S. government is essentially underwriting your position, uh, you know, you, your, your ally, the government, uh, has the power to create infinite money in seconds. Uh, and it's, uh, I think, very hard to lose in the market when you are backed by infinite money. You're never going to get a margin call or margin calls will be uh, matters of indifference to you if you can call on infinite money to back you up at any at any time. But uh, GATA doesn't make any particular claim as to whether you know Morgan is uh, long or short or profitable or unprofitable in, in any particular market right now. I, I don't think we have the the, the facts uh, clearly enough on that. You can uh, you can make cert certain inferences from uh, filings with the uh, the CFTC, but uh, they're not going to tell you what the total market position of uh, of the bank is. Okay, you know one of Gata's recent dispatches published uh, back in June sixth of this year highlighted the view of an European friend of Gata's that chaotic price swings will be engineered to shake off gold investors and. This unnamed person also believes that we can now expect gold to be attacked whenever a major government fundraising in the bond market, let's say, is being arranged or some big economic news is being presented. What is your view regarding his assessment that we will see increased volatility in the gold price moving forward and that they will be the result of such engineered manipulation? Well, this is just public record, Pat. There's a... Uh uh, State Department cable, uh, which uh, came out some years ago and by one of the gold uh, researchers. I really should remember who it was so I could give him, give him credit. Uh, it might have been Craig Hemke. Um, 
uh, of the TF Metals report. If it wasn't Craig, I should compliment Craig anyway for his work generally. Uh, but there was a, a cable from the chief of mission at the uh, U.S. Embassy in uh, London uh, back in late 1973 uh, to the State Department in Washington, where the, uh, the chief of mission uh, recounted that he had interviewed uh, leading bullion banks in London about the imminent creation of a futures market in gold in the United States. And the cable says that the bullion banks <clears throat> told the U.S. diplomat in London that a futures market would permit uh, the injection into the gold market of so much volatility that ordinary retail investors easily could be shaken off. Now, uh, that seemed to be the, 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 f the, the final approval of the creation of a futures market in, uh, in gold in the United States back in, uh, in 74. Um, uh, the, uh, the State Department was being told, oh, don't, don't worry about it because of the futures market, uh, you can inject volatility uh, very easily with all the, uh, the money the banks have and presumably the government has uh, and scare people away. Uh, and uh, I think that has, you know, been part of what has, you know, happened for, you know, the last uh, 40 years or so. Yeah. You know, Chris, why do you think people don't necessarily know these types of stories or don't know how a gold window was closed back in 71 or don't know how there's a thing such as the, the petrodollar? Why? Why isn't it common knowledge? Well, uh, because I think there's much more money that right now. Uh, in the financial industry and uh, in keeping people ignorant of, of that. Uh, the, the, the monetary system has a long history. Uh, there's controversies in it. Uh, these things are not taught in economics departments in, in colleges uh, across the world. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the government and, uh, and, and the big investment banks that are formerly government agents as, as uh, primary dealers in, in U.S. government securities, their financial interest is in, in keeping people ignorant of, of, of this. They don't want competition for the uh, financial system. They don't really want free markets. Uh, and they, they make millions and trillions and zillions of dollars every year uh, because people don't really know what's what's going on. Uh, uh, you know, my partner in Gata, Bill Murphy, our chairman, uh, is always very sore, and rightfully so, I am too, but I've gotten over it, uh, that uh, the uh, mainstream financial news organizations just will not report the gold issue comprehensively or even, even fairly or, or hardly at all. And I have to point out to him and everybody else that, look, you pick up a copy of the Wall Street Journal, uh, and from, you know, page A1 to page A24, uh, virtually every page has has a big ad from J.P. Morgan Chase or or Citigroup or Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or you know some other big investment bank that works very closely with the government in controlling markets. And Bill wants to know why God is not on the cover of the B section. I mean, uh, you know that's that's not uh, so hard to uh, to understand. The uh, the financial interest is against competitive currencies. The financial interest uh, is uh, is against free markets. And that's really what we've uh, been working for for all this time. Uh, GATA is, is, is working for uh, free and transparent markets and limited and accountable government. And uh, uh, those objectives are, are very much contrary to the financial system as it's structured now. Yeah, just to add to that, um, I have a relative. He uh, recently graduated with a finance degree from a major university in the U.S. And we spoke. And when I had told him that the uh, Federal Reserve is actually a, a private bank, private corporation, he did not know that. And he did not believe me. And I guess all four or five years going through university, a major university, he was never taught that. Well, well the Fed does have a peculiar structure compared to other national central banks. I mean, it, it does have a a, uh, a stock ownership structure, uh, and the, the shares are, are held by its member uh, investment banks. However, I long have argued that it's it's not much of a distinction because the uh, it, it's not that the Fed is privately owned. That's not, to me, the big problem. The problem for me is that the, 
the, the Fed is controlled by the financial interests, not by uh, the, the, the public. Um, the Fed was created by federal law in 1913. Its major officers are appointed by the U.S. government. Uh, so, so despite its stock ownership, stock ownership structure, the people of the United States, through their elected representatives, their members of Congress and the president, could change Federal Reserve policy anytime they understood what that policy was and how the Fed operated. Uh, uh, the problem is not so much that stock ownership problem, uh, stock ownership structure of the Fed, Pat. Uh, to me, the problem is the Fed has been captured by the financial industry. And that is not peculiar to the Federal Reserve. This is called regulatory capture. Uh, virtually every government regulatory agency in the United States, from you know regulating doctors and, and hairdressers and uh, you know other professional uh, operations, right up to the Federal Reserve, uh, has been captured by the interest that is supposed to be regulated. Now, why is that? It's because the people being regulated. Uh, are making their their livelihoods uh, from something that's regulated. They they get very much involved in politics. They get very much involved in regulation. They get themselves appointed to the regulatory agencies, and the public doesn't pay attention. Uh, we, the the Federal Reserve could be changed uh, to operate in the public interest and not just in the interest of the financial industry. Any time enough ordinary citizens in the United States rose up and demanded the Congress and the president change the personnel at the Fed, change some regulations, and make the central bank work for the public, not for the banks. Think that'll happen anytime soon? Well, I, I'm not holding my my breath, <laughs> obviously, but somebody has to point this out, and uh, uh, I, I hope uh, things can be changed without a complete uh, financial collapse and uh, another great uh, depression and. Uh, I think you know we're we're in danger of that. I mean, all all prices now, really, uh, all, certainly all asset prices now, uh, are being established by governments. I mean, the the re, the whole response to uh, the virus and the you know the global financial crisis of uh, you know twelve years ago has been government intervention uh, to prop up stock prices, to you know prop up all financial assets. Um, We've lost our our market economy. I mean, that's the the real disaster here. Uh, you know, one intervention uh, years ago uh, finally wears out uh, its effectiveness and has to be uh, facilitated by another intervention and another intervention, another intervention. And you know, after a few years, uh, you know, government is is juggling all these balls, is 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 rigging every market to prevent the previous intervention from from exploding and and collapsing. Uh, the, the real danger here is 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 the loss of our our market system, which really uh, I think has been the the great engine of of human progress uh, over the years. Uh, the other problem is the loss of our democracy. We we don't understand generally how the financial system is being run for the benefit of the very few um, and enriching the very few and impoverishing uh, everybody else. Speaking of markets and prices, though, a gold price beyond 2000 would have major impact on the psyche of investors since it would be a new all-time record high and it would further weaken the case for fiat currencies at a time where they are pretty much eyeball deep in trouble from the crisis that brought on the pandemic. We are now we are now about two hundred dollars away from a two thousand dollar gold price. Do you think the manipulators are able to keep the gold price from reaching that two thousand dollar mark? Uh, I think uh, you know they can defeat uh, the market system in gold uh, for a while longer. I I I know they they can create infinite money. I think they will be defeated only by physical offtake, just as they were defeated in 1968 uh, in the London Gold Pool by physical offtake. That's the only thing that will will defeat them. But I think that is happening. Uh, there are, you know, many pow powerful signs that that is happening. And, uh, you know, there are signs that uh, uh, some governments and central banks uh, want a higher gold price because they've realized that they have to 
uh, devalue uh, currencies and devalue debt because uh, debt is consuming uh, the real economy around the world. There, there have been academic papers written about this uh, <clears throat> use of gold by central banks to devalue debt, devalue currencies. Uh, Peter Warburton uh, uh, wrote about the gold price suppression scheme. Uh, he's a British economist. He, he, he really was the first one who identified it for me clearly uh, back in 2001. Uh, Peter Millar, a Scottish economist, a few years ago wrote a paper about the use of of, uh, of gold by central banks to devalue currencies and, and debt to prevent uh, interest payments uh, from going exponential. Um, so th this has been uh, written about uh, academically and I think understood by, by central banks for, for many years. We, we devalued the dollar here in the United States in 1933 and 1934 by uh, raising the gold price, uh, uh, central banks uh, very well right now may be engineering this. Um, uh, eight years ago, the U.S. economist Paul Brodsky and uh, Lee Quaintons uh, wrote a paper hypothesizing that the real scheme uh, by central banks with gold was was not just the price suppression that Gata was uh, was complaining about, but the real scheme was to uh, Brodsky and Quaintons said was to reallocate international gold reserves among governments so that the governments would be hedged their government their their exposure their foreign exchange exposure to us uh, dollar denominated uh, investments and uh, uh, and bonds would be hedged against the inevitable devaluation of the dollar that they would lose uh, uh, wealth in their foreign exchange when uh, the dollar was devalued, but it would be offset by a corresponding increase in, in their gold reserves. And Brodsky and Quaintance uh, hypothesized that the central banks were spreading gold around now in preparation <clears throat> for uh, the dissolution of the dollar system and uh, uh, some uh, uh, reestablishment of gold in the financial system. Now, just this week, uh, Niewenhaus, who was the researcher for Voima Gold uh, in Helsinki, uh, did some more research uh, uh, about the European central banks and found some more documentation uh, indicating that the European central banks have been planning for the uh, restoration of some sort of gold system, gold standard system, since the 1970s, because uh, uh, these countries and others realized that uh, uh, they need to get out of the dollar system, that the, the dollar is the primary mechanism of U.S. imperialism in the world today, that if you're tied to the dollar, you're, you're really uh, <clears throat> subservient to uh, the United States. Uh, Russia and China certainly have realized this. They're acquiring gold uh, steadily and reducing their uh, U.S. Treasury uh, uh, bond uh, position uh, to uh, uh, reduce uh, the uh, impact of U.S. sanctions on them. So there's this this uh, European uh, central bank uh, base that is uh, very uh, sympathetic to gold now, apparently, uh, because they want to get out from under the dollar. Russia and China increasingly do too. Uh, it's you know very possible now that uh, the central banks, I think, will spring on us a uh, uh, a new gold arrangement. Uh, you know, the, the United States uh, and Britain might even participate in it if they decide that they need enough devaluation of both uh, currencies and, and debt. So uh, I, <clears throat> I think there are more and more signs that uh, we're going to go back to the future in regard to, uh, to gold because it is the, uh, the, the only uh, real neutral uh, world reserve currency alternative to the dollar. You touched on this uh, a bit earlier. Congressman Alex Mooney, uh, he introduced the Gold Transparency Act about a year ago and continues to seek support for this legislation in an effort to push for the report on U.S. gold reserves every five years. If passed, it will be the first audit of the U.S. gold reserves in more than 65 years. What's your opinion with regards to why the United States has not reported on its audit of gold reserves for such a long time? Well, the U.S. has reported its gold stock, uh, but uh, to me, uh, that's not the important thing. I mean, there could be 8,133 tons of, of, of gold at Fort Knox or at Fort Knox and West Point. Uh, that's not really the question. The question is, 
who owns it or what are the claims to ownership? I, I used to joke that on on Monday, the U.S. Treasury Secretary could show the French ambassador around Fort Knox and say, hey, take a look at your gold. And on Tuesday, he could bring in the German ambassador and, and show him. And, uh, you know, Wednesday, he could bring in the Italian ambassador. And they all think they could own, own that gold. The, the real issue with any central bank's gold reserves uh, is the, uh, the impairment of those reserves, if there is any impairment. The a uh, secret uh, staff report of the International Monetary Fund from March 1999, uh, which GATA obtained, uh, shows that the IMF uh, refuses to uh, make central banks distinguish their gold reserves into two categories, gold in the vault, gold out on loan, uh, because if the public and, and the markets ever knew that, they would they would know what ammunition central banks have left for their currency market intervention. So central, the IMF continues to let uh, central banks uh, consolidate their gold position and to, to conceal gold leases and gold swaps uh, with their, their, their gold in, in the vault. Um, uh, c- central banks have been playing in the gold market uh, for you know the beginning of time. I mean, the gold standard itself uh, was a a mechanism for governments to to rig the gold market. And then then governments realized, hey, wait a minute, you know, gold has too much control over us. Why don't we control gold? And that's when they, you know, created things like the futures markets. But uh, um, I think, Pat, that there is a pretty clearly now a move, at least among half the world's central banks, or at least those central banks representing half the world's economy. There's there's a move among them, I think, to to move back to gold, to get out of the dollar system, to democratize, democratize the financial system a little bit. And uh, uh, the United States might just become part of that if uh, if it wants to devalue its uh, its debts uh, enough. Uh, you know, people talk about a, a debt jubilee, um, you know, a, a forgiveness of, of, of debts. I don't think that would ever be done directly, but it could be done indirectly by uh, currency devaluation. It could be done indirectly by by government assuming people's debts and paying them off in devalued money. Uh, so uh, in that sense, I think, you know, it's very possible we are moving toward a, a debt jubilee as part of the uh, fabled currency reset that some people talk about. Chris, how close are we to seeing an end of the manipulation of precious metals prices? Oh, you know, I, I hate people who say something is only a matter of time because uh, obviously everything is, is only a matter of time. You know, the, the old uh, infinite monkey theorem uh, held that if you had an infinite number of monkeys and an infinite number of typewriters, sooner or later one of them would come up with King Lear. Um, well, you know, with, uh, with infinite time, uh, you know, the Earth will be struck by another asteroid and the dinosaurs will come back. Uh, everything is just a matter of time, Pat. Um, I, 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 I don't make uh, predictions. All the, it's, it's, it's hard enough to find out what is happening now. Uh, and uh, when it's so difficult to find out what's happening now, I, I think it's all the more difficult to, to predict. All, all we can do is, is identify the signs and uh, uh, I think the, the signs do suggest that there are some profound changes going on uh, behind the scenes uh, that uh, are working in favor of gold. Will I live to, to see the day? I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I'd like to, but I know some, uh, some people, dear friends, uh, wonderful experts, uh, brilliant people, in the gold field, uh, who deserve to see the day and uh, are no longer with us, um, uh, they uh, they deserved it, uh, uh, and 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 they they didn't get what they deserved. Um, so I, I I don't know. All 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 I know is uh, we can keep pounding uh, away at this and uh, try to show the documents to the world uh, to pose the critical questions to. To show the world the critical questions the government won't a- answer, um, and let people draw their uh, their own their own conclusions. Uh, I mean, it, it, with infinite time, I I think uh, you know you'll know the truth, and the truth will will make you free. And 
the ascent of man will continue. Um, and I think that will very much uh, involve uh, the uh, re-recognition of gold as the premier uh, financial asset in the world and the the most suitable currency for a democratic world. But uh, uh, I'm 70 years old, Pat, and uh, the odds of my seeing the day are uh, are diminishing sharply. Uh, there's there's still hope. There's still hope. But if if you could make a wish that would significantly reduce or weaken the manipulation of gold and silver prices, what would it be? I, I think the great uh, greatest weapons of the manipulators now and the uh, governments and central banks that are not prepared to let us have a free market in gold uh, is the, uh, the mainstream financial news organizations. They will not report uh, what is going on with, uh, with gold. They will not put any critical question to a central bank and will not report uh, the failure to uh, answer any critical question by a central bank. Uh, if the mainstream financial news organizations would simply do their jobs as ordinary journalists and muster a little courage and let the world know what was going on here, uh, expose the uh, tyranny and unaccountability of central banking, I think the world would be transformed in a week. Um, I, uh, you know, I, <clears throat> agree that the, the, the power, the authority that governments have to create infinite money is, is enormous power. Uh, but uh, that power can be checked uh, by publicity, by information, by understanding. That's why the gold price suppression scheme has always been conducted, uh, or lately has been conducted surreptitiously. It's, it's because exposure would explode it. It, it, it. it works only because of deception. If that uh, deception is exposed, it doesn't work anymore. That's why they won't answer the questions. That's what, you know, they don't want these documents to come out. Um, they can be beaten, uh, but it requires uh, a, uh, a new courage uh, in uh, financial news organizations. Yeah, I hear you. Chris, besides Gata, are there other people who are actively tackling this issue of the rigging of the gold and silver markets? Oh, there's, you know, many researchers around the world. I no, wouldn't say that they're, they're closely associated, but we publicize uh, much of their, their work. I mean, gold is a uh, uh, relatively small and obscure sector. I happen to think it's the most uh, important sector in the, uh, in the financial markets because all prices take their cue from the ratio of uh, the gold price to, to currencies. But uh, uh, there's people who know about this, and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, the the organization that should be the uh, spokesman for the gold uh, sector uh, and free markets, the World Gold Council, I think is basically a tool of uh, of governments and central banks. It has never addressed the intervention issue, and I I don't think it ever it ever will. And I, I suspect that's because some of the major gold miners themselves are. Uh, uh, if not tools of uh, of the governments, they're very willing to uh, uh, avoid the, uh, the the issue. Uh, and, and I understand why the gold industry doesn't want to get uh, get into this issue. I mean, gold is the the most capital uh, intensive uh, business in the world, and since it's the most capital intensive business in the world, it it can't function without the major investment banks, which are very much uh, agents of uh, of the government. Uh, secondly, uh, the mining industry requires uh, the approval of governments to uh, uh, to operate in virtually every respect. Uh, mining companies need uh, mining permits, and uh, they're subject to environmental regulations and royalty requirements from from governments. So, uh, you know, mining companies can be uh, very much intimidated uh, out of this issue because they are. Uh, so much under the thumb of their own investment banks and their own their own governments. So uh, the World Gold Council is composed of major mining companies. Uh, uh, I don't think the major mining companies want the trouble that they might uh, cause uh, by uh, by getting into this issue. They'd uh, they they might lose their financing from their investment banks and they might lose their uh, mining permits from their their own government. So I. I, I've resigned myself to this lack of support from uh, most uh, big players in the gold mining industry. But, uh, you know, so we do what we can. I mean, uh, 
if this if if this story gets out more widely enough, uh, the uh, uh, the rigging of the market will will fail uh, because it requires deception. And uh, I, I'm still still hopeful. You know, thanks in part to your efforts in publicizing this. There 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 are uh, people who are helping to get this message out. It's been a long struggle. I. I never thought that uh, this would go on for for 20 years, but uh, it's also an enormous issue. It's you know probably the the the, the biggest issue of uh, of finance and economics in the world today uh, because it's it's the most sensitive, and that's why it's it's got to be suppressed. That's why it can't be told. Yeah, a lot of the thanks goes uh, right back to to you and Bill Murphy for all the work that you've done and the dedication that that you folks have in the resolve. But Chris Paul, before we wrap up, can you let our listeners know more about the GATA, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, and how they can support GATA's work? Oh, thanks, Pat. Uh, yeah, we're a uh, uh, nonprofit uh, educational and civil rights organization uh, incorporated in Delaware in the United States. We are recognized by the U.S. Internal Revenue Service as a 501c3 uh, a uh, charitable organization, so uh, that means that any donations to us uh, in the United States are federally uh, tax deductible. Um, of course, we we welcome contributions from anybody around the world, and uh, we've had some some good friends around the world for for a long time who I think are uh, determined not to let us fail. Um, our internet site is gata.org. Uh, there is a mechanism on our internet site for making credit card contributions to us. Of course, people can just send us our ordinary checks. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I try to acknowledge every contribution uh, quickly, but we do rely on on contributions from uh, ordinary uh, uh, citizens and investors. There's some mining uh, companies that have helped us out and are, are still helping us out. And I, I hesitate to identify them lest I get them in trouble uh, with, uh, with their own governments or their own, their own banks. Um, but uh, we, uh, we survive on, uh, on donations. Uh, we've been very fortunate uh, to, to have survived for, for 20 years uh, uh, because of some good friends. Uh, and uh, you know, I'd say anybody wants to send us $5, It'll be five dollars more than we've gotten from Newmont Mining or Barrett Gold. Okay, Chris Paul, we thank you for coming on the show and giving us some time, and it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Hope we can do it again soon. Oh, uh, thank you very much, Pat. Thank you, Chris. That was Chris Paul of the Gold Antitrust Action Committee. To find out more about his work, please visit data.org. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content. And do also check out the SBTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify. 